So hello everyone, I am Wenbin Ko, and um, uh, welcome to this machine learning with Python workshop. Uh, yeah, for this uh, workshop, we are going to record because some, some people might have type, time conflicts. So uh, we will have this recording. Uh, they can access to the uh, videos um, for, 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 the, for the learning. So uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm a fifth year a PhD student in bioinformatics. And uh, yeah, it's a very fortunate opportunity for me to teach this uh, machine learning workshop. And I feel this field is very exciting. And uh, hopefully uh, I can uh, share some experience with you and uh, maybe those kind of techniques or abilities can be useful for your later research and also for your later study. So uh, here is a notation uh, to the slides and uh, for the code or pseudo code, uh, they will only start with this uh, little arrow. For example, print hello world, uh, you can just copy those code and run from your Python uh, console. And uh, everything with the underline uh, is a hyperlink in this slide. So you can just click it and then uh, go to the web page. So for the workshop goals, uh, I really want to teach you guys uh, uh, about some understanding about the rationale of machine learning algorithms. Like you don't just uh, get certified with uh, how to use a package, but you want to have some high level understanding why this algorithm works. And also, uh, I would like to teach you guys uh, know some advantage and the limitations for some machine learning algorithms so that you guys can learn uh, or can, can know, uh, okay, for your specific problem, what kind of algorithms is the best fit. And uh, more importantly for this workshop, uh, we will apply some machine learning models to solve a specific problem and uh, also we want to tune the hyperparameters to make the model works better. So uh, I would, I have to say this workshop is kind of uh, challenging uh, because uh, this kind of materials can usually be a course for a quarter or two. Uh, so basically uh, it's kind of like uh, we have the theory behind and we also have some uh, tasks for the practice, like how to use the packages. So it's a kind of like a, a challenging to find the balance between those theoretical and practical things. And uh, from the roster I received, I know that many of you guys probably have a very limited experience with, with machine learning. So I will try my best to uh, explain things as clear as possible and uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope this can like give you um, some uh, good illustration. So another goal, uh, most importantly, is that we will learn how to use some aligned resources to make your idea into a model or some, sometimes we call it as a prototype, like the very naive version of your uh, machine learning model. So specifically, uh, when you have an idea and uh, you know, okay, what kind of problem you are facing, is it a supervised learning problem and supervised learning problem. And then we can go to the uh, Google or Stick Overflow or whatever resources you find useful. And then uh, you can uh, very quickly uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the guidance of the Python packages, you can quickly uh, write a prototype a prototype. And after that, uh, we are going to tune the parameters to make our model perform better. Uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, ideally we, we should make it uh, work better, but sometimes you probably will end up with making it uh, worse. So we are going to like uh, uh, explain or learn how to like uh, do some uh, tuning and then how to adjust our algorithm uh, to make the per performance better. So here is the agenda for this workshop. For day one, we are going to introduce 
some basic concepts of machine learning. Uh, and then we are going to learn how to use a Jupyter notebook. So in this workshop, we are going to use this one as our primary tool uh, because uh, it's very convenient to, 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 to do so for data analysis for teaching. Jupyter notebook is a good choice. And we are also going to use, learn some uh, package, package usage. For example, NumPy uh, is one of the most uh, useful uh, package for numerical computing, especially very useful in the machine learning field. And the matplotlab, which is uh, just a package for making plots, we will introduce maybe uh, some, some, some limited guidance on how to make uh, like a scatter plot or line plot or something. And for uh, day two, we are going to dive into the supervised learning. So basically, uh, supervised learning is that uh, data that we have labels. We are going to learn uh, two different things, like the classification. If your labels are categorical labels, like apple, orange, something like that. Well, if your labels is a uh, numerical, like continuous variable, we are going to use the regression. And the third thing is that when uh, when you have a model, you probably will overfit to your to your current data. We are going to talk about the regularization uh, techniques. For day three, uh, we are going to learn some unsupervised learning that you don't have a label for your data. So usually we will uh, have this problem with the high dimension. So uh, we are going to learn the dimension reduction and also clustering, like explore the the, the, the inner pattern in your data. So the two machine learning packages we are going to use is a SCK, SLK learn, and also the KRAS. So I choose these two because these are more user-friendly, like especially for beginners. And if you are advanced your research or your, your usage, like uh, you are doing some fancy neural, neural network things. So right now, like the TensorFlow or High torch is a good choice, but we are not going to uh, use them in this workshop. But those are like uh, the, the, the UNI provide very good tutorials. So I think you guys can also learn um, uh, it well just uh, checking those resources. So for some reference, uh, we mainly focus on this uh, this book and some machine learning with SIK, KRAS, and TensorFlow. So if you are a UCLA a student or you have a UCLA account, you actually can access it for free. So I provide a link uh, here for you just to check out. So if, uh, when you log into like the UCLA VPN, you access the library resources. So this is actually an online book for you. And other useful resources uh, like the cartoon shows, so basically, as you can see, machine learning is a very hot topic recently. So there are many, many uh, tutorials, blogs, or online courses that you can refer to. Uh, for example, the Angel, uh, Angel's uh, Coursera courses, uh, and also the Deep Learning book by Goodfellow, uh, ETAL, like the three founding fathers for the current deep learning uh, 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 field. And also, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can write to this Google Doc, uh, which is an online document, and just uh, put your questions there. We are going to go over those questions at the end of the uh, at, at the end of the workshop. Uh, either publicly, if this question is like a very typical that everybody will run into. So I will talk it. Uh, 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 what? Uh, well, uh, we can also go over like uh, privately, like uh, if this question is just uh, troubleshooting your computing environment or something. Uh, but yeah, just when you have questions, you can uh, write to the Google Doc. So other useful res uh, resources, um, like this is a more like a practical workshop. And if you want to learn a more math background or then it more systematically, I would recommend these three books. The first one is an introduction to the statistical learning uh, written by some famous professors in Stanford University, a statistic, statistics uh, 
department also the there is another book called machine learning uh, from probabilistic perspective so this book is very obviously very broad you can it covers uh, many many topics uh either in the statistics or in information theory or machine learning and then lastly if you are uh, dealing with the uh, deep learning things uh, this book is a uh, good good resources to refer so we will talk about like the some uh, like matrix uh, op operations and also the very famous uh, uh, back propagation uh, so when you when you have uh, questions about those uh, it's very good to refer to this book so uh, for day one let's just dive into the machine learning uh, i uh, uh, here is uh, like the overview of the workshop so this is a three hour workshop but uh, we're going to have uh, like a 10 minute break every 45 minutes so we will talk about 45 minutes and then take a break another 45 take a break and then uh, 30 minutes so uh, yeah just just trust me that you don't want to listen listen to me talk for three hours all the time it will kill you okay and the topics is about okay first we want to learn some key concepts in machine learning so what is machine learning when we say machine learning what actually we are talking about so another thing is that we learn some okay what types of machine learning we are dealing with and the machine learning applications and then we will move to Jupyter notebook like the get familiar with the tools we are going to deal with for example the uh, the, 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 the Jupyter notebook itself and the NumPy or Matplot like uh, the, the packages and we are going to lastly we are going to talk about one toy example and uh, get the very basic case uh, a small bite on the machine learning practice so the first question uh, what is machine learning so uh, as, as you might have heard about machine learning before but uh, when you want to give a definition for okay what is machine learning you probably have some difficulty right but machine learning the the field is quite quite kind of old uh, it, 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 it has existed for a long time but recently it uh, gets more and more attention and uh, for the definition there is one famous uh, saying in 1959 that the field of a study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed so yeah it's kind of abstract but uh, uh, we have some sense here that we don't need to explicitly for each type of questions we explicitly give it rules it can learn it itself another professor uh, uh, at CMU uh, gave a more I, I think more appropriate definition that a computer program is said to learn uh, from excess e experience e with respect to some type of class t and the performance measure t, uh, p if uh, its performance at the task in t as measured by p improves with the experience e so it's kind of wording right um yeah but but uh, here he actually mentioned the three important things here one is the experience so you only need to refers to data and uh, the tasks uh, which is uh, like the problem this machine learning algorithm is trying to solve it can be classification regression clustering dimension reduction and uh, there is also a performance uh, measure uh, if it's a classification it can be entropy loss if it's a regression it can be mean square error and if it's dimension reduction it can be reconstruction error so if you don't know these terms right now don't worry about it we are going to uh, talk about it in day two or day three but actually this uh, definition uh, I think it's it is very important that actually we can convert the machine learning problem uh, into an optimization problem like if we find a performance measure then we just want to optimize the performance right so this performance uh, we have a lot of 
uh, options for each task. So this one basically means okay, the problem the problem of it, 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 yeah, it's an optimization problem. When we see more data, use uh, more data to estimate the parameters that train the model and the performance getting better and better, and then generalize to uh, more, more, more new cases. So this probably can be regarded, okay, the machine really learns. So after we talk about the definition of machine learning, Another thing is that uh, why why machine learning? So why why do we uh, sacrifice our uh, our valuable life to learn those static things? So one thing one, one reason is that okay some problem some problems uh, with existing traditional solutions can uh, maybe um, maybe too complicated or really require a long list of rules. For example, if you are going to uh, like a uh, Request uh, re request a new credit card. And then the credit card company will probably will access. Okay, how many uh, amount like a quota I should allocate to you? And then should I give you this great credit card? I need to access your credit store uh, history and then make decisions. And those histories can be uh, quite complicated, right? So if you are going to use a very traditional way to make decisions like uh, write if else statement you probably will have a hard time to make the running or maintain maintain the the system but machine learning itself can um, simplify the code for example you just input the features and then the machine tells you okay whether you're going to give the credit uh, credit card to the to the person uh, or uh, what kind of uh, how, how how many like a uh, uh, credit uh, uh, limit you should assign to this person, and usually this uh, type of questions can be better solved as a machine learning. So here, figure one is actually the traditional scheme that uh, we explicitly write rules uh, and then try to evaluate, and then, then some problems. Uh, may be too complicated for a traditional approach to, to solve, although or they do, do, don't know the algorithm uh, for a traditional approach to solve. For example, the face recognition or voice, uh, like the voice recognition, like uh, the, for, especially for the nat natural language processing, uh, we don't have a, like, a really good explicit model uh, to, to solve those problems. But the machine learning uh, can actually learn the rules implicitly and uh, try to make our life easier. Uh, another important thing for machine learning is that they can adapt it to the new data, that they don't just memorize the data you have, but they probably you can learn something in one domain and apply this system to another domain. This is so-called the transfer learning. And uh, UN, it works pretty well. And uh, another thing is that machine learning can help us to get insights about the complex models. Like you train this machine learning algorithm, get the solutions, and uh, then you inspect the solutions, you probably have a new idea. And then this new idea can better, can, can, can be used, uh, treated as a feedback so that you understand your problem better, for example, uh, when we dealing with the bioscience, we found some interesting gene uh, to be very interesting. Then we go go look into this interesting gene and find what's the mechanism that uh, this gene leads to this phenotype. So yeah, it can help us to get more insights uh, to the complex problems. So when we talk about machine learning, we only refer to not very generous is we want to be as specific as possible. And uh, machine learning actually can be classified into these three types. One is unsupervised uh, learning, as I said, when the label is uh, not available. So for example, when we do clustering, we, we do the, the machine reduction PCA, we don't know the label. Another type is the uh, supervised learning. So basically we want to classify or predict this guy is, uh, has cancer or not. Well, uh, we want to predict uh, 
how old this guy is. So this is like a supervisor learning. When we train the model, we have the label. Like uh, this, this guy belongs to the cancer group. So uh, when we train, we input the labels to the learning algorithm. And then the third one is a reinforcement learning. So this one is kind of different uh, compared to a supervisor or supervisor learning. So reinforcement learning usually has a like a delayed feedback. For example, when we play chess, when we play the game of Go, we don't know, okay, whether at this moment, this move is a good move or bad move, right? We only know the answer till the end of the game. So those kind of uh, rewards is uh, uh, have some delay. We don't get the instant feedback from the uh, from the system. So besides these three category, uh, we also have a semi-supervised learning that we it's kind of like an in between of unsupervised learning and supervised learning that some labels or a very small proportion of samples uh, has this label, but most of them don't have this label. So UNE is kind of like a hybrid of unsupervised and supervised learning. And there is also another called self-supervised learning, uh, which is very interesting that the, that the learning system can generate some pseudo labels, like the label is not, it's not, it's not real, it's not available, but the system generates those uh, by themselves and then uh, supervise itself to, to, to learn something. Yeah. So, but uh, in our workshop, we are only, only focused on the unsupervised and the supervised learning. So predominantly on the supervised learning because this is more well-defined or uh, more easily to, to learn more mature. And the, many of the problems we face in our research is actually the supervised or unsupervised learning and the uh, reinforcement learning, which also have a very strong ability in solving problems, but uh, they require more, uh, more techniques. Uh, so we are uh, not going to do it in this three-day workshop uh, due to the time limit. So there are also other categories of learning, like batch learning or online learning. So batch learning usually refers to the system is trained using all available data. So it's usually takes known, and uh, that is done offline. The online learning is that uh, where the system is trained incrementally by feeding the data sequentially. So data can be fed on the fly. The advantage is that the online learning can scale up to a really huge data set. And uh, um, the better limitation is that the, when the data code is going bad, like on the fly, sequentially, the data quality is going bad, the performance will probably go bad. And other uh, categories like the instance-based learning algorithm or model-based learning, so instance-based learning is that uh, the system learn the example by heart, so try to memorize things, and then generalize to new cases by using a similarity measure. So one typical example is a linear risk labor that we have this training data set here, and when a new instance come, comes in, we just try to see, okay, what is the most similar cases uh, for this new instance, and then we can assign uh, okay, whether this belongs to type the, this, this uh, diagonal type or this square type. So another model then is trying to learn, uh, learn a model, or sometimes we call it as a decision rules, like uh, decision boundaries, to really separate these two types of uh, categories. For example, the uh, support vector machine, which is SVM. So those. Uh, uh, so, so when a new new instance comes in, uh, this uh, they will use the model or the decision boundary to decide whether this new instance is uh, uh, is type one or type two. So um, we will um, mainly talk about the the, the previous one, like uh, with label or without label uh, categories. So one is a supervised learning. As we said before, that the most uh, distinct uh, characteristics is uh, they have label. So basically here, uh, if we see our 
of data is a tabular data that uh, it's a table like and each row is a sample and each column is a feature and uh, uh, we will also have the corresponding y which is a label for each sample like as we said we can regard the sample as a, as a human individual feature as a gene and the value is a gene expression and the y can be like uh, this this human is a cancer patient or non-cancer and then uh, this machine learning algorithm is trying to name a function fx that we can decide what y is based on the x so x is uh, x1 to xd uh, just corresponding to the column d features and then supervised learning uh, is that we don't have this label and we uh, that we cannot do those kind of prediction, but unsupervised learning has a good, uh, good, 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 uh, good thing is that we can actually identify the patterns uh, in our data. For example, here still, uh, we have the samples and the features like the individual and the gene expression. We can use the dimension reduction to say, okay, if our samples can well separate into two different groups like cancer, not, um, cancer uh, unhealthy or different, um, uh, different populations, sub-populations, like this is called, uh, somehow like a, like a PCA or clustering algorithm. And for the reinforcement learning is that the learning system, we sometimes call it as an agent, observe the environment and then select and perform actions so after they have this action, the environment will decide, okay, what kind of rewards or penalties. So penalty is just an, like the negative reward uh, we should assign to this action. So it can learn by itself uh, what is the best strategy if we have this uh, uh, policy uh, to get the most reward over time. So just like the, we, we play a game, like the way uh, we don't really know, okay, this, this, this move can lead to success or failure, but uh, over, over some uh, time of training, uh, we can uh, master one game. Uh, so it's a very interesting field, and uh, the, uh, the right uh, GIF uh, image is actually uh, using the reinforcement learning to play a game of snake that uh, this snake cannot uh, hit the wall, uh, it cannot uh, hit itself. And whenever they eat this apple, uh, the lens is uh, increased by one. So after, after some iterations of training, it uh, can actually uh, achieve a very good performance. Like, uh, it looks like a human playing this game. So uh, after that, uh, talk about the different types of machine learning, we really want to know what, what can machine learning do, like the, the power of machine learning. So you any, uh, we probably have used it already that we can use the, the iPhone face recognition to unlock our phone. We can call Siri to uh, give it a command and uh, like send a text message to your best friend or something. And uh, when you go shopping, or just go to YouTube or watching some videos, uh, those, uh, those videos can recommend, okay, what you might like. So this is called the recommendation system. And uh, when you uh, don't know like the, another language, there is a machine translation. And Tesla have self-driving system. And maybe in Wall Street, some, some companies try to use a machine learning to predict a stock market and produce different billionaires. And uh, also we can, uh, for, for in, in the near future, or, what, what is happening now that we can ask the machine to create images, uh, write songs, uh, do some, uh, like um, write some novelties uh, that can be served as a human creation. So actually like uh, machine learning can do a lot of things that is, uh, so wide that I cannot even cover them all in a single page. Uh, more examples is about the uh, object segmentation. 
uh, like the left is big one theory, and we can um, train a machine learning algorithm to tell, okay, which person this guy is. And on the right is that, okay, we, we input a video, the machine can uh, try to segment each video, uh, each object and recognize it, uh, like a multi-object uh, recognition problem. And more examples, probably you already heard about it uh, over the news, like in 2016, we have AlphaGo that uh, mastered the game of Go and the beat human players, uh, which is quite a big news at the time. So this kind of AlphaGo, they actually use the uh, reinforcement learning. And uh, in the application, they try a Monte Carlo tree search problem. So uh, if you play, have ever played the game of Go, you, you probably remember that we have 90 times 19, like uh, 361 uh, different places to, to 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 put your uh, to put your, uh, your 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 key and then uh, so each each position on the on, on the on the board can either be occupied or not occupied. So this generates two to the three hundred and sixty one. So uh, this kind of search space is so huge that uh, they even uh, it, it's it's more than the total number of atoms in our universe. So in the traditional uh, machine learning uh, technology, we cannot train uh, effective uh, algorithm to solve this problem, but uh, we actually use two types of uh, neural network. One is try to, try to uh, train a classifier that uh, tells you which position you should go. And then they also train a regressor you still using the neural network, try to predict, okay, if you place uh, at this position, what's the potential reward it can actually give you. So this Monte Carlo tree search technique actually can minimize or reduce the search space uh, to a manageable level so that the current computers or computing powers uh, can, can, can solve it. And uh, more recently, uh, AlphaFold, uh, which is a very, yeah, still another very hot topic uh, in the biology field in 2021, they actually can predict the protein structure from the, from the primary sequence, like the amino acid sequence. So they use some kind of a, a transformer, which uses a separate attention, like you pay attention to your uh, local environment, the context, and they generate really uh, good results compared to the experimental ones. And uh, yeah, this year, when I heard this news, I, I thought, okay, uh, seems like AlphaFold is trying to uh, make many people uh, lose their job. And uh, just last week, uh, there is a nature, nature paper about Alpha Tensor. So basically, um, this uh, algorithm is trying to find a better way for matrix computation. So our humans um, have like, there is a good, good algorithm that uh, can save the computing, uh, speed up the matrix multiplication uh, uh, to, some, to some level, but alpha tensor, like uh, a pure machine learning based algorithm, they can find a better way to do it and uh, uh, speed up the computation. And uh, if you, uh, if you uh, follow uh, up the updates of AlphaGo, uh, you probably felt, okay, it's kind of uh, scary that uh, they evolve along the time, not just uh, mastering the game of Go, like uh, based on the human knowledge, or uh, learns from millions of millions of games, uh, uh, they, they can achieve the, like the, uh, or even outperform the, 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 uh, outperform the human. But later, there is alpha zero that they don't require the human input data. They just purely play by themselves. You simply just input the rules and then they know how to play better. And uh, this uh, alpha go zero actually outperform alpha, alpha go in a larger sense. And there is also alpha zero that not only go, but uh, also other games 
using one single algorithm, uh, they can achieve the state of state of art performance and also the mu zero. So just uh, just just you don't even input the rules, they can then just interacting with the environment. So this is kind of like a, a, like a trajectory to terminate us, right? We don't even our human is no longer important to for, for those uh, building those uh, artificial intelligence. They can then by themselves and with our without our help, right? But but it's kind of like uh, exciting to see, okay, how magic this uh, machine learning algorithm, what seems for deep learning algorithm uh, can achieve. So, uh, so now uh, we are working on the bioscience field. So probably we should just focus on some, uh, some, 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 uh, some other experts like the biomedical research. So machine learning is very widely used in the imaging. Uh, like uh, when you have the microscopy, uh, you probably have a really limited resolution to uh, to see the cell surface proteins or something. But the deep learning based method can enhance the resolution. And uh, actually, it's a very really, uh, interesting or like exciting field to do. Like uh, you, you can just uh, uh, approach or go beyond the limit of what. Of, of the current technology limitations. And also the sequence alignment uh, or sequence sequencing based on like you run through this known rate sequencing, you observe some signal and uh, this machine learning algorithm can tell you uh, with high accuracy that uh, what, what which base this, uh, this position is. And uh, also for upper fold uh, protein 3D structure prediction and the other areas like the genetic risk assessment. Uh, when you send your uh, genomic data to 10x genomics, they can tell you, okay, okay, you are going to have what probability for developing heart disease or some other disease. So it's very closely related to the health industry and disease diagnosis. Uh, we probably have heard about it. So you go to the hospital, get a get an NMR scan or just uh, the PET scan, they can tell you, okay, whether you have cancer or, or not. And also the drug design, like antibody, ant antibody design uh, for uh, immunotherapy. So many of those fields have the machine learning uh, application. And uh, on the right, it's actually like the number of publications across the years. So it's, it's kind of like an increase exponentially since 1996. So it, it's a very really hot topic in this field. So I hope this kind of uh, news, exciting news can uh, motivate us to learn this, uh, learn this machine learning algorithms. So uh, later we are going to uh, dive into the machine learning model like uh, from a very big picture. But uh, let me see, probably we can take a 10 minute break here and we will come back for the later contents. Um, so for this big picture, uh, I will go over each section uh, with another section. And uh, in the meanwhile, we are going to learn some key concepts uh, so that you have a better understanding uh, when we need to train a machine learning model, what we actually do and uh, what kind of like uh, challenges, uh, limitations or something we should uh, pay more attention to. So first, uh, when you have this idea, you need to uh, define it to be a task. Now, in other words, we need to frame, frame the problem. So uh, based on the labels you have, you need to de uh, decide whether we should formulate uh, it to be a supervised learning problem or unsupervised learning problem. And uh, when, uh, when you have labels, uh, you probably sometimes don't trust your label. So you uh, kind of like uh, make it into beans, it as a classification problem, or sometimes you trust the continuous numerical value um, 
frame it into a regression problem. But the first thing is that, okay, we need, we need a target. Uh, we need to translate your problem into a machine learning problem. And then uh, we will, based on the problem we select, we will have a corresponding performance measure. So in other words, we will have a loss function. Or, well, sometimes we call it like the cost function. So for example, for regression, we have the uh, MSE or root mean square error or MAE, like a mean absolute error. Uh, we'll talk about it later. And for classification, we will have this accuracy or cross entropy uh, as a performance measure. And uh, uh, for dimension reduction, we have reconstruction error. And the uh, cross uh, function, loss function, probably you have seen it uh, in the literature or heard, it about, heard about it from other like, seminar talks. So basically it means how bad your model fits the data. So there is also another uh, function called the utility function me measures how good your model fits the data. But uh, it's just like a very similar terms and uh, usually we use the North, North function. And then uh, after we define task, select the performance measure, we go, go to get the, get the data, prepare the data, like download from public data set. Or if you are working on experiment, you get uh, some samples. And then uh, after that, you import the data into your uh, computing platform, explore the data structure, like uh, know, okay, what, what's in, inside the data. And also sometimes you do some descriptive analysis. For example, you try to explore, okay, for the given response variable, like the, the labels, uh, what's like the, uh, like the, the association between this label and the, some features, or is there any like outliers in your data? So you can do some uh, exploratory uh, of, uh, in, within your data. And then um, do some data processing, like to tidy up your features. And also sometimes you, do, you, need, you need to do some feature engineering. For example, if you want to predict the the diabetes of a person from the weight, you probably will need to convert the weight into a body mass index, which is like a, try to normalize the influence of height, right? So sometimes you create new features uh, or sometimes you just uh, ignore some features because those are not informative. So anyway, after you prepare the data, you will need to create a test a test set if you are doing the unsupervised learning. For example, um, uh, when we train a model, we don't want to restrict our model to the training data or testing data we have. We want to uh, make this model works in general. Like whenever you have a new batch of samples, uh, you expect this model to give you good results. Um, so the only way to know how well your model can generalize, so uh, to the new cases. So it's actually to try your model on the new cases. And by doing so, we actually need to split our data into the training and test set. So the training set is what we use to construct your model, like do your parameter fitting estimation. And the test data is just to try to, okay, when you do the training, you want to evaluate how well your model performs. So this sometimes called we want to use a test data to estimate the generalization error. And the traditionally, uh, we use like 80% of samples for training and hold out, hold out the 20% of samples for testing. But uh, yeah, it depends on the actual cases. Like you can do 70 for training, 30 for testing or, or, or other like uh, types of or scenarios. So after you get the test data, the next thing is try to select a model. So here is just like a, a, a diagram on how to select a model. And uh, later we will talk about the, uh, each, each kind of like a techniques in day two or day three. But for the select model, uh, whether the first thing you need to ask is that, okay, do you have sufficient data? 
um, if not, like if, all, if you only have like uh, three or five samples, then there's no way to do the machine learning, right? You, you probably don't want to uh, struggle with, with the machine learning things. So if you don't have the sufficient data, you can try to get more data, like whether you use the public, public data set that is uh, well, well suited to your uh, problem. For example, if you are working on like some cancer, you probably will go to the TCGA data set to get some gene expression, gene emulsion, or mutation data from there. Or if you are working on the imaging data, you can do some kind of uh, data augmentation that uh, you can rotate the, the image to treat it as a new sample. So this is another way to increase your data. So the data is always uh, like a very important thing, like uh, you can think the machine learning model is an engine and data is actually the fuel, the gas. And the, if you have a sufficient data, uh, you try to, okay, see what is your like a problem, problem uh, should be classified. For example, if you have small data set or fixed number of features, or you don't have data labels, you go down that, okay, we, uh, then, then, then you ask, okay, whether we are going to do the prediction uh, class or value. If it's a class, then we will decide uh, whether we have labeled. Uh, if not, then we do clustering. If yes, then we do some classification, like a tree and classifier to, um, for example, support, support vector machine, uh, some tree based uh, models. If it's a uh, continuous variable, numerical values. Uh, if it's just a realizing your data, you can do dimension reduction or some uh, other like uh, like uh, also clustering sometimes can also be used to for for your visualization. And if it's uh, like uh, a label the value, uh, we can do the regression. And the more advanced uh, uh, machine learning techniques, for example. Uh, you have connections between the entities. You can do the graphical neural network. And uh, if it's uh, spatial data, uh, the conv uh, convolutional neural network is usually the good, uh, it's usually the option. And if you are dealing with uh, longitudinal data, or well, sometimes we call it as a sequential data. So the recurrent neural network, uh, which is um, uh, like a very still was a very uh, hot topic in the past eight years. Uh, well, some probably you have heard about like the uh, LSTM, like no short term memory. Uh, so those will, uh, it's well suited for the sequential data. And uh, if you, uh, if there is no, no others, um, uh, if, if, if there is no uh, other categories, uh, uh, so probably you can go to the multi layer perception, like uh, go, go for the deep learning things. Um, so um, uh, a small uh, small summary about the CNN onion is that the CNN is uh, localized in in space. For example, you have an image like a hand right uh, digit. So those like uh, edges or those pixels, they jointly can show what is the pattern. So those localized in in space thing. Uh, will be a good ideal target for CNN. And if it's localized in time, for example, last time and this time, uh, you have some kind of dependency across the times and uh, the, uh, your, 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 your next state is influenced by the current state and the input data. So in that case, uh, the recurrent neural network is a, is a good choice. So uh, we will focus primarily on the, on the right, Right, right hand branch, like the uh, support vector machine, traditional machine learning method, and, uh, uh, and supervise the clustering, dimension reduction, regression things. So, for the left hand branch, like a high advanced uh, network, uh, because it uh, requires a lot of training and uh, it's a little more complicated. So, uh, we are not going to touch that part at this workshop. So after you select ideal model, or a list of models, 
uh, an instable algorithm to, to, to try, uh, you can train a model. So when we talk about train a model, we actually mean that when run an algorithm to find the best parameters that uh, make the model fit the data best. And hopefully this kind of model can make good predictions um, to the new data. So generally as well. Here is like a, a, a example about the fitting that we want a good fit, which is in the middle. But uh, uh, sometimes in your in your in your attempt, you probably run into uh, issue with the underfit that your model don't fit your data point well, or your model is too uh, unconstrained, so it uh, actually fits uh, the data too well. So in this case, uh, it's like uh, uh, like uh, when, uh, just uh, imagine that we write a dictionary in Python, we memorize all the data and its labels. So in those cases, it will perfectly fit the data, right? But those uh, system or those data data structure will not be really useful uh, for a new batch of data set. So probably you need, need make a no 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 uh, make really little accuracy um, prediction the new data. So uh, yeah, just trying to, we, we want to train a model that uh, in the middle, like good fit. So um, after we do some training, uh, there are actually some hyperparameters can influence the performance. So this is uh, different to the parameter, model parameters we have talked before that the hyperparameter uh, it's just a parameter for the learning algorithm, not the model itself. So just trying to um, uh, use the neural network example, for example, you have already specified the structure of your neural network, like your number of input uh, and uh, nodes and the number of hidden layers and uh, also the number of nodes in each hidden layer. So those uh, are called the hyperparameters. And these hyperparameters remains the same during your training. So although it's adjustable, but it's not updating during your training. So this is called the hyperparameters. And um, we also we want to make uh, like a find a good good combination of hyperparameters. So how to do that? Um, uh, just about the way that we have the data for training and testing. So one thinking, one thought is that for each of the uh, hyperparameter combination, we can train the model uh, on the data set, on the training data set, and then evaluate on the test data set. And then across all the uh, combination of uh, hyperparameters, uh, all candidates, you pick out the model, model with the best performance. So this is sounds, sounds reasonable, right? But um, uh, can you, can you, uh, Think is there any problem uh, underlying this thing? Yeah, just try to not to look look for the slides for the need, but yeah, just think. Okay, do you think it's reasonable or do you think it's it has some problem? Anyone? Yeah, that's okay. Like, uh, if you, yeah, if you have any thoughts, you can just speak up. Yeah, it's unrestricted. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I probably will just uh, move on. That uh, this sounds reasonable, but uh, actually, uh, it has some problems. For example, if you only have one model, this would be okay, right? Like. Uh, you, you don't want to tune the parameter you train and then you, you evaluate on the new cases, the, the data set that uh, the model has never seen. Uh, this is sounds, sounds like a good thing. But uh, the, the, the thing is that we have multiple things, uh, multiple models, and we measure the generalization error multiple times, like for each model we measure it. And uh, then we pick out the best. So that means we adapted the model and the hyperparameters to produce the best model for the particular test data set. 
So what does it mean? That means, okay, your test data set, uh, the, the, this part of the scheme, it's kind of like the overfitting to your test data set. So consider, okay, you train in this way, and then maybe three months later, you have another batch of data set. Uh, although it should be really like a representative uh, to the training or testing, but uh, it's not the test data set. So your model probably uh, perform bad on that new batch of data set because it's, it's, it's kind of overfit your particular set, right? So one, one solution uh, to solve this problem when during the hyperparameter training of a Turing is that we can actually split the training data uh, into another another two parts. One is the reduce the training, and one is the validation. So the validation can serve as the uh, as the original test data set for choosing hyperparameters. So, um, uh, yeah, just uh, just the same, very similar to the to the previous things. And um, uh, there is one small uh, sm small risk here is that when we have a really small validation set, we probably will choose the hyperparameter or model uh, by, 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 by chance uh, to be a like a suboptimal model. Like uh, it's although it's 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 good in this game, but uh, but uh, because the validation set is so small, there is some randomness. That you have the chance to pick up, pick out the model that is not the best performance with with an, with with an ease, uh, with the less better performance. So one solution is that we can use a cross validation. So that means, okay, for this uh, kind of splitting, like split training data into validation, we can repeat it and uh, take the average across all the repetition. At the, at, at the, yeah, at the, like take the average performance and select like the best. So this will give us a better, a better estimate, uh, give, give more accurate results. So here, uh, after we have this solution, we can actually uh, re rephrase the, the training into these four steps. Like one is that we train multiple models uh, with various hyperparameters on the reduced the training set, which is this part, blue part. And then we select the model that performs the best on the validation set. And when you when you have a relatively small data set, you can repeat the validation. So like a key for the cross validation. And then uh, you, with this uh, best choice, you can train the best model on the full training set. This will give you the finalized model. And then after that, you evaluate the model with the testing set. And this evaluation uh, will tell you the generalization error. So this is like the, the whole picture uh, for train a machine learning model and evaluate. And uh, with this whole picture, we also go over the details, right? Like uh, from the, the, the questions in, in, in this training, and then we come up with a better solution. And uh, for the next topic, I want to talk about the main challenges for machine learning. So as, we, as, as, as most of us are like work on the uh, biology related, Build. So the machine learning probably seems to be like a magic box for, 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 for us, but uh, um, I would say that uh, machine learning is not a good medicine for what it is. So you need to consider, okay, whether you uh, need to pay attention to these challenges uh, is when, you, when you apply a machine learning model. So the system will not perform well if you're Training data set is too small. As I said, uh, it's especially like in the biology related field, the sample is expensive, right? You do a sequencing uh, for one sample, it's probably you end up with uh, uh, 10 samples or something. And uh, if you want to use a more advanced uh, 
many algorithm like a scene and scenes. So probably you you will need a lot of training uh, data set. And uh, if the data is not representative, that means okay, the data has some bias, uh, or it's it's noisy, or polluted with irrelevant features. Uh, in this case, the the data uh, the the model will probably will not perform well. So for the efficient insufficient data, yeah, as I said, it takes a sometimes takes a lot of time, a, a lot of data, to make it work properly. And the non-representative data means sampling bias that your training data set is not a good uh, representative for the population. For example, you train a particular uh, machine learning model in this uh, like European population, and then you want to uh, generalize it to all human population. You probably have some uh, like. Uh, Confounding issues or uh, something bias issues that make your better and make your model perform less well. And for the poor quality data, data uh, sometimes we see that due to the technology artifacts or just due to the the, the, the data itself that they don't have the uh, good quality, like some data outliers. So for those cases, the machine learning algorithm uh, will feel very hard to detect the underlying pattern because you are basically facing a lot of noise. So it's hard to find the needle in the sea, right? So you need to perform some kind of data glazing, uh, try to uh, decide uh, whether you want to remove some clear outliers to make your data more clean. And sometimes you have the uh, irrelevant, irrelevant features so sometimes we call it garbage in, garbage out. So you cannot think, okay, machine learning is a, is a good medicine. It can produce whatever results I want, right? So for those cases, you will need to do some kind of feature selection that you want to select the most useful feature to train your model and feature extraction, like uh, try to combine some system feature to produce a more useful useful one, like the EMI I talked about before, or sometimes you want to create new features. So uh, yeah, th those are the four challenges uh, we have. And uh, hopefully I, I add some like uh, solutions or guidance on how to deal with them. So as a summary, uh, we, uh, in the past uh, one, and maybe one and a half hour, we, cover the key concepts in machine learning. We know the definition of machine learning. Uh, we know what, uh, when we talk about machine learning, what we actually like detailed part specific field we are talking about three types of machine learning. And we know the big picture and also some details, uh, key concepts in the training and machine learning model. And uh, specifically, we learned what is testing and training and what is loss function and uh, some uh, basic understanding or uh, about overfitting, hyperfitting. And uh, we talk about the uh, hyperparameter tuning and uh, cross validation. And lastly, we cover the challenges in machine learning. So I hope this kind of uh, uh, introduction gave you uh, some kind of sense. Okay, we are, when we dealing with machine learning, uh, uh, what part we, we should uh, uh, pay more attention to and uh, what kind of solutions we have. So uh, I think it's enough theory for today. Uh, we, under the next, next half of our uh, workshop, we are going to do some practice. So one is a Jupyter notebook, and uh, we will learn how to use some popular packages. And uh, lastly, we will like uh, get a hands-on experience with a core example in machine learning, especially in supervised learning. So Jupyter notebooks is a tool we are going to use uh, very heavily in the workshop. And uh, it's uh, open source, which means free, uh, web-based and active uh, computing platform. So web-based uh, means, okay, it's very uh, easy to, how do you say, it's kind of easy to use and uh, you can do it in active. You put a code on that, run, and then you get results. 
So it is very suitable for do some kind of uh, data exploration. You want to build a prototype of your of your code. So um, this is a good choice. And also it's very convenient for sharing, uh, making documents, uh, making plots, get a very direct, straightforward uh, visualization of your data. And so it's very powerful in data analysis and also in education. Uh, some similar applications uh, like uh, JupyterNet, if you have experienced with it before, so it's an uh, extension to the notebook and um, uh, other language like R, they have R Markdown, so which is uh, similar to what Jupyter Notebook is doing. And also MATLAB live script, live script. And uh, uh, so here is like uh, one fun fact that Jupyter stands for uh, junior, uh, which has J U uh, Python and R. So like uh, in combination, they form Jupyter. So this is how the name, uh, how, how the name uh, uh, forms. And the native language is Python, but you can also install a kernel for other language. For example, you install R, you can run R code in the Jupyter uh, interface. So yeah, I think this fun fact is uh, something good to know that you can uh, talk to your like colleagues, the, the NAM members. Like, hey, do you know what does Jupyter mean? I know, <laughs> right? So it's a good thing to know. Um, if you don't don't install, uh, if you haven't installed it on your note uh, on your computer, you can follow uh, this these tutorials that uh, also you can click click the link uh, to the official website of the documentation. Uh, just simply install it with a single command, like open your open your terminal, uh, input a pipe and then uh, try to run the notebook. And uh, sometimes you uh, store your data on Hoffman 2, so you don't want to, okay, export, export your data to your local computer and then analyze. So Hoffman 2, uh, the, like the university computing platform actually provide uh, uh, some, some good uh, script for you to directly launch the Jupyter notebook on the computing cluster. So you can also click the link uh, to the official web page and you will find the like the, 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 the part about connecting to Hop and to via Jupyter notebook. So uh, here is a code that you can run like uh, uh, with uh, just, just a download of this uh, Hop and to Jupyter notebook script and you can check the usage using this uh, double hyphen help or you can specify your username and uh, uh, specify the time like four hours uh, you want to request and the memory the uh, eight gigabytes and also the version of your python so yeah this is just a simple example and you can you can try it on your own so in this workshop uh, we will uh, primarily just uh, using the local computer uh, part uh, for the for the for the learning because we are doing some very light weighted uh, uh, computing and uh, for most of the users if you are using Mac MacBook or Mac OS uh, it's pretty easy to do and um, if you are using the Windows you can install like the Alaconda so uh, which is uh, also another, another software, just download it. And uh, after you install, you can also find the Jupyter notebook within that. And uh, if you are like uh, more, um, yeah, if, if you just don't, if you hate uh, Mac OS or Windows, you can also use a uh, Google co Collaboratory. So this will also provide the notebook uh, from the web, uh, web browser for you. So after you uh, open the Jupyter notebook, you can create just following this uh, new and the uh, Python three. So create a new notebook, and then you can type in your Python code to see how it works. So which is the very first thing we do whenever we get get to know something new, right? 
And uh, so some working materials you see in this GitHub. So probably you can just uh, uh, copy paste this page. Uh, yeah, let me just try it now. That this is the uh, this is the GitHub page. So let me see the. This is a terminal. So, um, so first, uh, yeah, if you don't have that, you can type in for notebook. Yeah. And uh, let's see how to. Notebook. To install the two pattern. And uh, because I already have I, I already have installed it, so it has this uh, this message. And uh, after that, uh, you simply go to this command git clone to clone the GitHub uh, folder to your local computer. So uh, I already run this code before, so this is the uh, so after you run the code, you, you will see this folder. And then next we uh, cd change directory to the folder. You will see day one and the slides, uh, which don't have any slides right now, but I will uh, put it later. So uh, after that, you can try Jupyter notebook. And then you will see there is a window pop up like the on page, uh, which is just the directory that you launch this to Python, like the, the QC bio uh, machine learning with Python folder. So you can see the A1 slides with me bio within this. So the folder is uh, has this icon. Let me to move the folder icon and the, the file with this file icon. So we can click uh, into the day one and then open this notebook. So for the previous, I mentioned that you can use a new uh, Python 3 to create a new notebook. So this is uh, what you have, like print hello world. And uh, run it, like, uh, you can simply hit the Hit the button here. Uh, just a, just running a regular notebook, a uh, Python code. So uh, anyway, let's just dive into the the notebook I provided within the day one folder, and uh, take a while to loading because it's kind of a big. So here uh, I provided some kind of uh, uh, tutorial or some kind of documentation for this notebook. For example, you can access the GitHub repository using this link. And uh, for more information about registration, you can go to the website of QC Bio Workshop. And this notebook is uh, heavily based on the previous uh, instructor, Dr. Sun Yang. And the previous collaborative fellow, Dr. Tango and uh, Renato, uh, for the support supporting materials. And uh, for today, the goal of the notebook is that uh, we learn how to use some tools. Uh, as I mentioned, Chinese pro proverbs that uh, better tools make good work. So those uh, tools is actually very useful if you are working with machine learning in Python. And uh, we are going to. Uh, Go, go into some uh, detailed usage of, uh, with this uh, Jupyter notebook. So the first thing uh, is the Jupyter notebook usage. And next I will introduce some library usage. And then the third thing we move on to a for example in supervised learning. For the Jupyter notebook, uh, so still we see this interface uh, with different manual like a uh, file, uh, you can see a lot of things. Um, and uh, maybe you can explore it later. But uh, the first thing I want to mention is that the, the, still the tool, uh, tool manual here, 
the first thing uh, is the save. Like uh, when you make some changes to the Jupyter, you what you can save it. Although it's automatically saved sometimes, but uh, sometimes you want to explicitly save. And uh, here it's like the this this little plus is trying to add a new new chunk of code for Markdown, and the 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 Caesar is a cut. Try to delete or just uh, uh, paste, like a click and a paste, or and and uh, here it's a uh, copy. The up and down is uh, is try to move the current chunk uh, uh, up or lower, and the run uh, is try to run the code, and uh, here is the uh, interrupt and uh, also some kind of restart the whole notebook, restart and rerun the whole notebook. So basically, uh, when you hang over your mouse, you can probably see the the, the prompt uh, run sales in like you know something. So yeah, we have covered this edit sales run code restart the notebook. So another another way to restart is trying to kind of interrupt run run clean up run uh, re restart and run more. So yeah, this is another option that uh, the clean output is just, okay, we restart the whole notebook, clean all the environment, and uh, we want a very clean experiment, uh, uh, environment, and then uh, clean all the output in the code chunks. And the run war is that, uh, okay, after we restart, we want to execute all the, all the chunks in the notebook. And here it's also it's another uh, uh, drop down menu that uh, you can either switch from code to markdown, uh, which is like a documentation chunk, or stick with a code chunk. So yeah, this is a good thing to use. And here, uh, this is uh, like the command palette. So basically, when you click, uh, you can see like the other 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 commands, but uh, and, and also some hot keys. So for this, um, uh, edit the markdown markdown uh, markdown chunk. You can simply double check, uh, double click, and then you will see the the raw format of the markdown syntax. For example, uh, I will I will go uh, go over with you later. So uh, the second part is the markdown usage that uh, just trying to make your documentation looks better. So one is the heading. Basically, it start with this uh, this pound symbol, and if you want to make it bold, you put a two stars. And then if you want to make it uh, italic, then put only uh, one single star. And you can also use a quote. So here is like the raw syntax, and uh, if you run, so basically you can see the the you, you can see the effect. For example, bold and it, and also some examples I put here, like code. Uh, I just copy and paste the uh, the, the famous saying of or definition machine learning. And uh, also other things like order list, you simply use one, two, three. And the order list, you simply use this uh, uh, small hyphen. Uh, it will give you a, a order list, like uh, starting with this uh, little dot. And uh, if you want to uh, insert the code uh, uh, in the markdown, you can use this uh, small tick for uh, three, three, three uh, continuous ticks to insert a code to the markdown. And also, if you uh, know about the latex, uh, this markdown uh, also support the latex, latex formula. For example, here, it's a MSE mean square error uh, definition. Uh, it's only you input the, the, the formula here. It can actually show it in, in, the, in, the, in the page. And also, you can add a horizontal line, simply put the uh, many, many minus or hyphen, and uh, also you can add a link or image. Yeah, so basically this uh, this chunk tells you how to use the Markdown syntax to make your 
documentation looks better. And for more usage, uh, you can click the tutorial or refer to the cheat sheet um, about uh, how to use it in a more professional professional way. The third part is a code chunk, and uh, we simply run the Python code uh, with it. So when you run it, it will output the results uh, below. And uh, the first thing uh, is probably we want to install the packages. So uh, at hand, you can try it to uh, run. Just uh, simply replace the site package with the package names you want. So here I already installed it, so it uh, gives this. And uh, here is the exercise. Probably you can try it on your own to install other packages if you haven't. So maybe I gave you guys uh, one minute to do it. Uh, so for the code, code chunk usage, it's very, very similar to the regular Python code. Uh, you simply uh, put the code in and then run it. For example, uh, run a simple calculation and print it out. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can directly put the syntax and then it will give you a result. Alternatively, you can also use a print uh, to print the results. So here I just use uh, some very simple uh, math, math operation, also the, the for loop uh, to do it. And uh, here is a question uh, that uh, what happens if you run this this chunk first, and then we run this the fourth chunk. Uh, you can you can just try it on your own. So let me try here. So I comment the the code with a with a pound, uh, and we can simply press Control and the question mark to make it back to the code. So after we run it, we will receive a type error that seeing uh, the X, uh, we expect it to be an uh, int, but uh, here we have a range. So this is because we run this chunk uh, and then we move to the fourth chunk. So this actually uh, is, a, it is something uh, we should keep in mind that the execution order is very important. So uh, the deep uh, detailed explanation is that uh, for each Jupyter notebook, it runs a kernel like a hidden console behind each notebook. And so when you run a code cell, that code is executed within the kernel. And uh, if you try to name a variable, uh, see if the results into a variable, those variables will be like in, in place and hidden. In those in the environment, and um, the kernel state uh, will persist over time uh, between cells. And uh, when you like uh, try to run the fourth chunk, uh, yeah, it will just uh, okay use the previous uh, x like a range to do the calculation and report this error. So uh, a good way to avoid is that okay when you try to run a chunk. Uh, you will need to run the associated chunks. And another thing is that, okay, you can restart the, restart the Jupyter notebook and then run from the beginning. And the alternative is that to avoid using the same variable name for different uh, uh, tasks. And the 1.4 section gave some useful tips about how to restart the notebook. You can simply kernel restart and some useful shortcuts. For example, uh, you just want to run the chunk, you can simply press shift and enter uh, to do that instead of clicking the run button. And the, for create a new cell below the current cell, you can use uh, command B also A for after, uh, about the current cell. And the uh, Y uh, is changing the cell to code and change the code to markdown. And the control plus uh, question mark 
we explained before is that uh, we want to comment a code line in the code chunk. So for more information, you can check the help and the keyboard shortcuts for more usage. So after you, yeah, as I said, the Jupyter notebook is very useful for prototyping that you don't have a very mature code. So after you've uh, finished all the coding and make it sure it works, uh, so basically you can convert uh, it to be other types, for example, HTML, uh, LaTeX, if you write in the formula, or just a Python, uh, if you want to write uh, in, uh, like, uh, in, in, in the command line console. And uh, for the save your whole homework, you can press the save button or simply control plus S for Windows, command S for Mac, Mac OS. And when you open this uh, notebook uh, from the previous one, you can see this green uh, uh, green color, which means this uh, notebook is running. Uh, so uh, when you just uh, close this one, th this no no notebook, uh, it still remains the running state. So if you want to properly close all your notebook, uh, simply go to the close and hold. So it will shut down the notebook. And when you uh, try to reopen in a notebook, you hello, uh, re restart and re run all. So here is a, a cool notebook uh, list for you to check out. So basically it contains many, uh, many, many good things uh, you can check out uh, when you are free. So we are going to take another 10 minute break and then we will return back to packaging and the toy example. Uh, so let's continue to uh, learn some uh, useful packages in, you're probably going to like uh, came across in the machine learning model building or model evaluation. So uh, here is a list of uh, useful libraries. Uh, uh, actually, like uh, those libraries can save you a lot of trouble uh, when you when when you when you need to calculate something, use something. So always remember to look for like if there are any built-in functions you can use uh, before writing your own functions. Like uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel uh, all the time. So here uh, it's a list of. Uh, some useful packages, uh, the NumPy, which is very good for the matrix calculation, numerical things. Pandas uh, is a data frame uh, specific. So uh, it also has other useful, uh, like uh, you, you can import the CSV file uh, into your Pandas data frame and save your uh, results into a, like a CSV file, TXT file or something. So it's very useful. And the SciPy is uh, for scientific calculation. There are many like uh, steps, uh, functions, uh, or some other uh, scientific functions in there. And the matplot uh, lib is for the uh, plotting. And uh, usually when you uh, train a model and then get the evaluation, you want to see, okay, how the, uh, performance change across the training time or how you uh, compare this algorithm with another algorithm. You want to display those uh, those results with a plot uh, instead of just the numerical values. So matplotlib is a good choice. And then as it's, as I learn, it's a major machine learning package we are going to use in this workshop. So workshop in uh, this workshop uh, will use some packages and those packages are in the in the bound bound front. So if you haven't installed it, uh, you can go back to the previous uh, code chunk and then try to install. So uh, let's first dive into the numpy. So in the standard Python, we probably have like uh, I assume you you guys have some experience with Python coding. So in the standard Python, we have this list and it has some advantage. For example, it can uh, be used as a container to contain different types of objects. And it's very easy to insert or concatenate. But uh, the advantage is that um, 
for example, when you try to do a, like a element wise sum, uh, you need to write a for loop or something. So that is not much kind of concatenation, uh, element wise operation you can use. And also it's also uh, very slow for the large uh, list. It takes a lot of memory and uh, uh, yeah, when you're dealing with the matrix, you don't want to use the, you don't want to use the list that you do it. And also uh, it has limited use for functions, uh, for example, mean variance maximum, but in NumPy, you can do it easily. So, um, so to use NumPy, uh, first we just import the packages uh, in Python. Just sometimes we uh, want to save the typing effort. So we just import NumPy as a, another, like a short uh, two, two network MP, right? So we can first uh, try to create a NumPy array from the list. Here is an example that we create a, it's a list containing five elements, five, five integers, integers. And NumPy can be, uh, array can be created uh, when you input the list uh, into the NumPy array. And uh, here uh, it's uh, just a three examples we are going to use in the following. So it, so here is just a very simple, uh, simple, sim simple illustration that when we use the uh, use this plus symbol to uh, try try to sum the the sum sum the list, uh, basically it will uh, concatenate this two lists uh, into a one. For example, for the previous it's a list of list of five, and then we a plus a will just give you a list of of, of ten. But if you want to do the element-wise uh, addition, so uh, NumPy is a good thing to use. So basically you uh, put B plus C, so this is, will, will give you like the one plus five gives six, two plus four gives six and so on. So uh, we, it also uh, support for some other uh, mathematical calculation, like uh, you add a constant, you time a constant, you raise up to like uh, the power of three, one, so it will always do the element wise operation and the product division uh, take the module, so similar. And also it uh, support a lot of uh, math functions. For example, you want to read up to the, like the, to go to the exponential, uh, give the sine cosine function to the, to each element in the NumPy array. So simply call it. So here is just like a very limited uh, uh, list of uh, functions. It has it actually supports a lot. So you can go to the NumPy official document uh, for more for, for more information. So another uh, thing I want to mention is that the NumPy it's a it's a it's a it's a uh, what, what actually in Python it's a zero based indexing. So every element, for example, in the in the list in the in the in the tuple. Or in NumPy. So the first element well, has an index of zero. So this is uh, different from R or MATLAB or Junior. So kind of a different naming style or coding style. So um, uh, so for the for, for this workshop, uh, we will use first element, second element, third element. So those refers to the one base indexing, like uh, the first, second, like natural, natural language. And uh, when we say, okay, index n, uh, index uh, number n, um, the, the position n, you only, we refer to the like a computer language, the, the zero based uh, Python indexing. So we can actually do the, to try to access the, each element uh, using an index, like uh, in this uh, square bracket. So the first element uh, we, in, in this B in array is one, second is two, so, which is a very intuitive as we define B as a number array from one to five, right? And one simple uh, or very powerful usage is that we refer to the last element B. We don't need to calculate the length of B first. We simply just use the minus one. So, the, yeah, it's a kind of like a personic usage of Python. And uh, if you want to uh, get all the elements in B, uh, simply put a uh, Co column uh, in, inside, or just don't put anything, just use a B. And if you want to uh, like, uh, 
slice the uh, slice the the numpy array uh, using uh, like for example, you want to take the the first uh, one, two, three, uh, first three element. You can use uh, one, two, uh, one column four uh, to the to 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 the numpy array. So remember that the last one uh, it's not included. So it's uh, like a zero based uh, coordinate system. So the last the last term. Uh, the, 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 the number four, which originally denotes to the fourth position, but uh, it's not in, in, included in this uh, expression. So uh, for the slicing, we have other expression. For example, you want to take the uh, select element from the start from zero to the end, which is uh, minus one. And then at a step two, like uh, for each, uh, for 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 for, for, for this action, you you skip 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 one in the middle. So uh, you can use this one, uh, this expression zero column minus one column two two uh, stands for the steps step size. And uh, yeah, so as uh, we seen previously, if you want to select words, just uh, simply don't don't put the the numbers. Uh, at, uh, before or after the column, so you can uh, write those things um, very shortly, like a uh, select from zero to the end and step size two, or just a reverse B, which is uh, simply uh, only use the minus one at the end. So yeah, it's a uh, really some somehow kind of a personic way, and some. Sometimes it's kind of uh, like uh, harder to directly understand, but uh, yeah, it's what we use, currently use. So for NumPy, uh, there is uh, actually another concept called attributes and methods. So attributes uh, means uh, some, yeah, just I, I did suggest that the, some properties this, this uh, object contains, and that the methods is more like an uh, action or, or a function that you can apply. Uh, apply to the uh, uh, apply to the to the, to the object itself. For example, the B if we call that size, which is attribute uh, B dot size. Uh, you can get five uh, number of dimension and time shape uh, will give you the like the the the, the still the dimension of each uh, the, the size of each dimension and the. Uh, uh, the following two is like the methods, which is uh, okay, perform an action. For example, we want to sum the what the elements are. Uh, we can simply call the sum. Uh, notice here, this, we have a pair of parentheses here. So this will call a method. And uh, we can calculate the product of our all elements, uh, simply put the prod, prod, prod uh, parentheses. So here is the, uh, just a very, uh, very brief introduction to the usage of NumPy functions or uh, NumPy uh, attributes. So for more information, uh, you are really encouraged to encourage to check out the link in the notebook by yourself. So we have talked about how to create a NumPy array from a list. And here we are going to talk about how to create a NumPy array from other functions. So for example, we can simply uh, use this uh, NumPy arrange from the start to the end and the other step size to create the, the following array. And also we can use the uh, uh, NumPy line space uh, to do it. And uh, for the specific type, for example, sometimes you want an integer uh, of, of size 16, 32, 32 uh, you can specify them. Or you sometimes you want to float, um, you, you can simply use the as type uh, to do, to do that. So also sometimes you want to use, uh, create a numpy array with wall one filled in with wall ones. Uh, you can just use numpy ones uh, with five. So this will give you uh, a length of five uh, filled in with wall ones. And uh, similarly, you can do it with the numpy zeros. So when you type in the functions, uh, when, for example, you type in the numpy dot zero, uh, you can use the auto 
combination by pressing the tab key. So it will prompt out. So you don't, yeah, this will just save you some typing trouble. So in the previous uh, introduction, we only talk about the NumPy array like a vector, right? So which has a length of n, but only like a, yeah, just length of n. It's a, it's a single vector. And uh, sometimes we want to create a matrix which has a two dimension. So you can you can do it uh, still using the uh, using the list form that uh, you wrap the each list. Uh, in with, with another uh, another list, so it's called the nesting list, and uh, this will give you uh, a matrix form of lambda. And sometimes you want to create a tensor, which is like a higher level of a matrix, like a three dimension or more dimension. You can create it using the similarities, like wrap around matrix with another with another with another list. So here we also have the Attribute for this high dimension, higher dimension numpy shape, they give you like the shape of a, which is like three three rows and four columns, and uh, n dimension tell you this is the dimension of two, which means it's a matrix. And we can also do some um, convert from one dimension uh, from one type of uh, numpy array to another using this shape. For example, we have for uh, Pair of elements in the matrix, and we want to make it into a tensor with uh, like a three dimension, uh, three as a like a row column. Maybe the last one I call it as a height x or y and z. So here, after we do the reshape, it will uh, convert the, uh, the 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 original matrix into a higher dimension array by rows. So. Uh, you can also set some uh, metric axis uh, to convert into by, by column or something. So here I, I I will not go into that deep that far for here. So after the conversion, we can also call the shape dimension to check the to check the result. So for the for the elements um, within this numpy array, within this matrix, we want to access them, uh, for example, by, by index. Uh, simply just a core array uh, with like a, a square brackets with the index number. So for example, you put in i and j uh, to access the element at position i and j. So when you want to access the whole column or whole row, simply just a replace one. Uh, index with the uh, column. So yeah, this will give you a column or row. And also you can do it uh, like a uh, range to uh, to the numpy array to, to do some slicing. Yeah. So here uh, we, uh, I just show uh, how to use it uh, by some for example. For example, the original uh, array is a matrix, and then we want to access the first row, second the column. Uh, what's that? So, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. The, it should be the second row and the third column because the numpy array is uh, it's it, it's zero based, so it should be this like uh, one plus one is the second row, um, uh, two plus one is the third column, so it's thirty. So. Uh, yeah, we simply like uh, easily access the element value. We can also do it using this a uh, bracket around one and bracket around two uh, to access it. But uh, the problem is that it's a little less efficient because when we create, when we call a square square bracket one, it will actually create a copy of vector consisting the low one of a. Uh, instead of just uh, directly accessing the positions. So this will uh, be less efficient. So uh, the following are the examples for getting the row or getting the, the column, simply replace one by the column. And um, for the higher dimension array, it's uh, usually also the uh, similar things, but you expand from two digits to maybe more digits, like uh, 
uh, different, uh, you, you specify different dimensions. So here is an exercise. Uh, I probably can give you guys maybe uh, two minutes to try and then, uh, yeah, probably you have this like a uh, solution within yourself, but just try to not look at it and try it on your own. So I will show the solution, uh, which is uh, yeah, very, very, very easy or simple. Uh, you probably have other ways to uh, to finish it, but here I just provide a, a example, a template. Uh, so uh, when you like uh, want to run run this one, you uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, like the comment line. You can use the press control and the question mark to make it a code, or uh, you can yeah press again to make it a comment. Yeah. So here. Uh, just run it. Uh, this will give you a, 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 a still like a matrix button with only one column, like a 10 rows. So for this A, um, I mean, you can also like uh, print it out uh, to see the reverse the order of the columns. So um, next, so we move on to how to access uh, the, the elements by some logical condition. So previously we know how to do it using the index itself. So still, uh, just uh, just remember that the operation it's a broader casting to like the to to every element in the NumPy array. So when we try to compare a with uh, the constant of twenty five, it actually compare it with uh, what every element in the array. So uh, to access, like uh, we want to extract all the values that are greater than 25, we simply use this operation uh, as a, more like as an index uh, to access all the values in A that are greater than 25. So this will give you a list to, uh, from 30 to 400, which is all greater than 25. So uh, here, another example, maybe I will give you guys uh, one minute to try it by yourself. So I, yeah, I just show the solution that uh, we want to replace all the all numbers with, with, with minus one. So basically we just write out this uh, uh, logical condition that we module two equals one. And then uh, this will return true and false for each each position, and then we assign minus one to those arrays. So the the following are some kind of like a uh, utility functions that probably you are going to use in the future, uh, which like the find the minimum value across all the elements, uh, which you use the numpy dot mean or max to find the maximum. And if sometimes you want to find the, okay, what's the index of the minimum or maximum value, you can use the arc and max. So this will give you the index, for example, in our original uh, uh, array. Uh, yeah, we can, yeah, maybe we just print out here. In the, one, two, three, yeah, in the ace element, uh, ace element, um, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a maximum value, but uh, because this is a zero base, so the index we get is seven. So uh, other, other functions, for example, described in the stats, uh, the stats module. So this will give you a more like a comprehensive information about the, like the distribution, like minimum, maximum mean variance uh, of the data. So it's also very useful when you want, just want to do some exploration, uh, descriptive uh, analysis on your data. And uh, for the mass operation, we calculate the sum before. So other operations like mean, median, the variance, standard deviation, or sometimes you want to calculate what's the average, uh, or what's the sum across row, across column, uh, which is just uh, simply by sp specifying the axis. Like if you put zero, it's 
row is if you put one is column. So yeah, I think this is uh, all about the uh, NumPy package. So yeah, as again, like uh, this is a very brief introduction. If you want to know more, check out the document. And always when you try to uh, achieve something with the NumPy, always try to find the built-in functions. Don't write uh, by your own because you need the built-in built functions is more is most uh, is, is the most efficient one. And uh, when you write your own functions, you probably have some bug or uh, logical flows that that's not uh, accurate. But uh, built-in built-in functions is you need the safe choice. So for the third one, it's uh, uh, for, for the next next one is a metaplot life. So we uh, this is uh, like a whole whole bunch of uh, plot uh, uh, plot package, and uh, we are going to just introduce a very basic usage that we are going to use in the future. So one uh, is that um, uh, just trying to show the examples. It, it can be uh, it can be uh, done with the with with this package. So basically, this is a uh, it, it's a video. It has a heat map, and also it has this kind of like a, a curve, which is showing the cal calcium uh, signal, the concentration signal across time. So actually, uh. A similar things we uh, can be achieved, like the similar effects can be achieved using the Matplot lab package, but we are not going to do do that today. So just a very simple, uh, simple usage. So uh, you anyway we call this uh, import this package as a PLT uh, plot, which is short for plot, and uh, yeah, just as three letters uh, make it easier to use. Uh, yeah, we use the pi pi plot uh, sub package in this uh, whole package. So if we want to plot like a line plot, of course, like we, we simply, okay, input a numpy array and the plot dot plot, uh, this will generate the plot. And then when we, uh, when we run the plot the shoe, this will display the plots uh, into the output. So yeah, this is very really easy to use. Uh, you simply input or, or when you have similar things, you uh, change this, this input part and then generate similar plots. And um, oh, we also want to plot maybe uh, different curves on the same plot, uh, simply use a different, use an other one. Like uh, you can input uh, X at the, at the axis and Y at the Y axis and uh, combine two curves into a single plot. You can try it in this way. And also, uh, yeah, this is like uh, using the default settings, default color, default, uh, uh, default uh, uh, axis. Uh, and we can also customize it to better serve us. For example, uh, we want to use the, uh, we use a dash line to collect different dots. So we can use double hyphen. And if we want to specify the shape, the side shape, uh, for example, uh, o for the circle uh, S, which is the square uh, for the square dots. And we can specify the line wise, the color, and the, the label of the legend. So uh, yeah, it's all in this uh, plot function. And then we can also specify the X label, Y label, uh, also specify the ticks like the, for, for the Y axis. And then after that, we uh, only plot show to generate these figures. So um, sometimes we don't merely want to show in the data book. We want to save it into a file, PNG file. So this can be done using uh, this plot the save, which will give you like you specify the name or pass, it will generate the figures. So um, here is like the if the figure generated based on you if you run that code uh, from your command uh, you will find this figure like uh, generated so which is uh, the same and you can also specify the like the ratio of y axis uh, x axis but uh, yeah, those are, we're not going to cover those today. 
So uh, there is a whole bunch of galleries like generating different types of plots. You can click the link and uh, find out how to make those plots. They pro usually provide some code, so you can use that as a template for your uh, for your application. So yeah, that's all about the uh, the plot. And uh, the finally for today's workshop, we are going to do some toy example for the supervised learning. As, as we have said before, uh, supervised learning different types, and uh, the toy example we are going to address is the supervised learning. So based on the uh, labels we have, like uh, if we have a discrete label, it's a classification problem. Uh, if we have the continuous label, it's a regression problem. Like classification, you only try to separate two different uh, types. Uh, by drawing like a line or boundaries, uh, which make uh, very similar to the majority uh, supervision machine. And uh, this uh, regression gave the example of the linear regression. And uh, to, uh, to, to do this uh, toy example, we, uh, we, we will just uh, simply use the, the data set provided by SK, uh, SLK Learn, the, the, the package. So uh, we will import this node breast cancer. There are also other fancy uh, data sets uh, provided by us, Kate Nen. Uh, you can check it using this link. So uh, after we uh, import that, we can run this function just by providing this uh, double parenthesis to call, uh, call this function. And it will give you this uh, breast cancer. We name it as the breast cancer. And uh, it will contain data uh, target and also other uh, metadata information. So, uh, if we want to know uh, what's like the the shape, what's uh, what, what's the dimension of the data, you can try uh, this function that uh, we want to access the attribute of data and the attribute of the, uh, the the attribute of the shape. So this will give us the feature that we have uh, five five. Uh, 569 times uh, 30 is a matrix, and the target we have this um, uh, this this 569 vector. So, just a quick reminder: the features it's the uh, quantitative uh, characteristics uh, for each of your samples. So here, the 509 is actually the samples, and the 30 is the number of features you have. So the features uh, I'm not going to too much detail about the features, but uh, the uh, especially uh, like particularly in this data set, it's a measurement of the microscopy image of the nuclear cells and the, 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 the target is a label and it's like the ground truth label, like uh, showing whether it's uh, uh, what kind of uh, cancer types uh, this, this, uh, this sample has. So we just uh, uh, print out the target, uh, which is uh, denoting zero and one, uh, which is just like a two different of uh, cancer types, like a uh, malignant and the benign uh, cancer. Uh, if we just uh, show the first instance of the data, the features, we have this uh, 30 dimensional, uh, the, the, the vector of 30. So here, uh, we our, our 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 task is that can we use the uh, feature to predict uh, the the target? Like, uh, can we use the features to predict uh, what kinds of types it has? Uh, to do so, um, yeah, since this is a toy example, we just try to use a distinction tree to do it, which is very very uh, intuitive. Like uh, when we, like it, it's very similar to the, the game we played. Like uh, I ask you 20 questions, then I can probably guess what you are referring to, what's in your mind, something like that. So basically you start with the one feature and uh, you compare with the threshold and uh, then you make decisions whether we should go, like if, if it's yes, we go from the, we go to the nap. If it's, uh, if it's no, they we go to the, uh, right, and then so on. So for each feature and each threshold, we will, uh, we will eventually uh, 
get a resolution, whether this is neighbor one or whether it's neighbor zero, like uh, what type of fancy it has. So uh, this W1 and W2 is uh, what the machine learning algorithm meant. And uh, it's just, uh, just, just um, uh, this, this figure is uh, just uh, like a uh, brief, brief illustration of the, what the algorithm is, is doing. So um, we just, uh, yeah, just uh, to do a really quick uh, overview that we uh, first uh, create the model, uh, just uh, import this decision tree classifier and uh, specify a hyperparameter with four. Here we do, don't do any hyperparameter tuning, we just uh, use one. And uh, then we want to fit the model, right? To train the model, uh, simply call this dot fit function. Uh, or method. Uh, so we input the features and then we input the targets. So this will give you, uh, okay, it's a decision tree classify your object with maximum depth four. And then we can actually check whether it fits the data well or not by just checking some samples. For example, for the very first example, uh, we input the index zero the true label is zero. And we can also get the predict label, uh, simply run the predict method. So here uh, we input, uh, we use the, the, the model dot predict and input the features. So remember to put uh, like a, a square bracket here to wrap it into a list. And then this will give us uh, zero. So basically the predict and the true label is, uh, is the same, which is good, right? Because this means our model fits the data well, uh, at least in this sample. So just to check another another sample, uh, index of 19, 19. So this will give the similar results, uh, the prediction and the true label is, it, is, uh, is the same. So here is like the exercise, although it's exercise, but uh, I'm, uh, right now, I, I think it's. Uh, I will just uh, show the show the answer uh, to get the accuracy, which means among all the samples, uh, how many accurate uh, predictions you made. So, which is uh, quantified by this uh, true positive, which means which means it, it's uh, it's a uh, it, it predicted as a positive or predicted as a one, and then it's actually one or true negative. It, predicted to be zero and it's actually zero. So which means, okay, all the classes are, the, are aligned with, align well with the, with the truth uh, among all the, all the samples P plus N. So this is how we do that. Like we predict the, we run the predict method on the whole data set and then get the predictions. And then we just want to compare the predictions with the true label this will give us uh, uh, give give us a vector a vector of true or false, and then we calculate those uh, uh, like uh, if, if if it's if it's uh, true, then we will if it will give one, and if it's false, if it's false, give zero. So uh, yeah, we sum and then divide by the total number of samples. This will give you the accuracy. So yeah, just a uh, Try to print out the intermediate results, the true or false. Uh, when after we run this, uh, we run this this line, and we also can uh, plot using a uh, using a histogram uh, or bar plot, which uh, showing uh, the number of uh, correctly assigned or misclassified. Uh, mistake mi mi misclassify the samples. So we can see that uh, the, the majority is uh, correct, correctly uh, predicted. And the accuracy is actually approaches to 98%, which is not bad, right? It uh, performs uh, like uh, just make a very really little uh, mistakes uh, less than 0.5. So yeah, it's believed to be a, okay, a, a good fit. And um, here yeah, we just do some like uh, very naive training that uh, we don't do any validation. We don't do any like split the data set into tests and training. So the important question is that, okay, uh, 
although we do so well uh, in this fitting, but uh, how can we tell if it's uh, not overfitting? Uh, Canyon is not underfitting, but uh, how, how, how are we going to tell uh, this model can generalize to, to other new samples? So right now we didn't touch their field, but uh, we will cover this part in the day two, uh, like uh, when we talk about more details about the overfitting, uh, underfitting, and also more details about how to uh, train on the training sample and evaluate on the test system. So I think that's all for today's workshop. And uh, I hope you guys learned something. And uh, uh, so for the Jupyter notebook part, I go a little faster uh, because of the limit of time. But I I think you, you, you guys can just uh, go through the notebook. It has a very detailed documentation and then try to uh, Google things, uh, try to like check state overflow or something by typing how to use NumPy, how to use something like that. So it will always give us an answer. So yeah, with, with, with that, I think that's, that's what for today. I will see you tomorrow.